Brian Dunning's dream car, in fact, is a Porsche Carrera GT. In fact, if he decides to buy this car, in fact, by using the money he gets from Big Oil and Big Pharma, in fact, Brian Dunning will never own a Porsche Carrera GT. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, Brian Dunning. Sidney Bradford is a man who was born in 1906. Unfortunately, he was born with a genetic condition and he went almost completely blind. In fact, he did go completely blind as an infant. Nevertheless, he grew up healthy and happy. He had a family, he worked as a machinist. He was able to feel the machine tools in the shop and, and do his job. And then in 1958, when he's 52 years old, he had a new surgery and got complete cornea replacements in both of his eyes. And so for the first time, he could see nearly perfectly well. Well, you'd think that this would have been a great thing, but unfortunately it didn't work out so well for Sidney. Everything he saw, he had no idea what it was, and it terrified him. He would be looking at this, and he would walk around and say, what in the world is that? Until he did this. Oh my gosh, it's a chair. What in the world is that? It's a chair. Everything he saw was completely frightening to him. Cars, buses, trains terrified him. Unfortunately, uh, it, it didn't work out so well. He took his own life after only about two years. Why would his brain do this to him? He had perfectly good input coming into his brain. His brain was not able to process it correctly, and it had tragic results. Could the same thing that happened to Sidney Bradford happen to any of us. Now, eyes on me. I want you to all look straight at me. You've all been looking at George Trabb, our friendly, lovely, and talented host today. Give you, gonna give you a hint. He's wearing a white suit. He's wearing a bright blue tie. Now, by a show of applause, what color shirt is he wearing? Is it white or is it blue? Show of applause if you think it's white. <laughs> show of applause if you think it's blue. Step out here, sir. I lied, his tie is not bright blue, and his shirt is blue, they're both striped. You all failed. The talk is done, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I'd like to have, I'd like to have, um, oh, well, let's do one more thing, in fact, here. What color is my tie? I'm gonna give you two choices. It could be dark blue, it could be dark red. Show of applause if you think it's dark blue. Dark red. No tie at all. I think we've got about two-thirds of you so far. I'd like to have one person come up here. Just anyone, the first person to come to these, to these steps is fine. There we go, very speedy, awesome, I like it. I'm actually gonna use about 20 people during this talk, so if you're interested, just kinda congregate in this area to speed things along. Step up here, please. Now, are you here? Supposedly, yes. You are present? Yes. This is a personal experience you are, you are going through right now. I would like to think. Face the crowd. Wave hello, say hi. Hi. Say goodbye. Turn around, face the back. Now, since this is your personal experience, you now have an image in your mind of what you've just seen looking out there. I want you to tell me without turning around, how many people are standing along that left side of the wall? Maybe eight. Just study that image that's in your mind. Eight is not remotely close. How about this first middle row? How many people did you see sitting in that? Study the image in your mind. You have no idea. What color was the chair you were sitting in? Red. The carpet out in the hall is red. What color is the carpet out here? Hmm. I, I think it's a combination of colors. It's a, a combination of colors indeed. You scored very poorly, about 25%. Thank you very much. <laughs> you may return to your seat. <laughs> Sir, tell me something from your life you've completely forgotten. 
that, that didn't work. <laughs> now, when I, do this, this, when I do the Skeptoid podcast, that's okay, we're done. <laughs> Man, you got ripped off. My biggest enemy on the show is people's personal experiences. No matter what the subject I'm talking about, everyone has their own personal experience by which they know that I'm wrong. I know that Wi-Fi harms me because I've experienced it myself. I know that ghosts are real because we had one in my house when I was going, growing up. I know that organic food tastes better because I've tried them both myself. And one of my favorites is I know that UFOs are real because my Uncle Bob saw one and he's a very reliable person. Uncle Bob is not lying. None of these people are lying. None of them are hoaxing. They're all perfectly honest people giving me perfectly honest reports. It's just that their brains have failed them. Now, earlier this weekend, Bruce Hood and Steve Novella have both given talks discussing a lot of these phenomena that we're going to see today. But today we're actually going to do live demonstrations showing how and why a lot of these works. You understand the facts and figures from the people who are actually doctors and know this. Now let's see it in action. Okay, I'd like to have 10 of you. We don't even have 10 people here. We need more. Come on up and stand in a line. If we don't get 10, that's okay. We need a group. There we go, we got a good group. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. And the rest of you continue loitering. We will need you as well. A lot of you have seen this before. We're gonna do it again. I'm gonna give a list of words. Listen to this list of words. Was that not ten? My my brain failed when I counted ten. <laughs> Here are the words, listen to them. Candy, sour, sugar, bitter, good, taste, nice, honey, soda, chocolate, heart, tooth, cake, eat, and pie. Now, by showing your hands, I'm gonna read you a few more words. I want you to tell me whether the word I read is one that was in that list or not. Raise your hand if it was in the list. Don't raise your hand if it wasn't. And raise your hand halfway if you're not sure. That's perfectly acceptable. First word. <laughs> Taste. Okay. Point. No takers for point. Sweet. Thank you very much. You're all done. Taste is the only one of those words that was in that list. Sweet was not in that list at all. You can return to your seats. Now, this is often described as implanting a false memory, which is probably what you've heard it described as if you've seen it before. And that's not really true. I didn't really implant a false memory. None of them remembered me saying the word sweet. What happens is that their brain didn't store a digitally recorded list of the words. Their brain stored the general idea of the words, generally sweet, food, yummy concepts. And so when they remembered the word sweet, their brain said, yeah, sweet remembers the general idea of that recollection. So yeah, it was probably in that list. So I think it's a little bit disingenuous to call that the implantation of a false memory. This way that the brain does this, storing the idea of what happened rather than the facts and the digital information of what happened, is really what's more useful. If you're a Cro-Magnon uh, out hunting uh, el elephants, did they, I, they may have hunted elephants, I don't know. Mammoths, let's, let's assume for the facts of this case that uh, cro manions hunted mammoths. They probably did, I don't know. You needed to know the idea. You didn't need to know any digital information about where you would find them, you know, the time of day, anything very specific. You just needed to know general ideas. And that's why our brain pretty much works this way. As we live and develop, we, we build a whole reference database of our experiences. And as we continue growing and, and developing and living, that reference database changes. And so when we look back, the memories that we extract from that are recontextualized each time. And our brain correctly remembers things differently as time goes on. You might remember Steve Novella gave the example of where were people during the Challenger explosion. Right after that, they answered the questions the way they thought it was. Months later or years later, they answered the questions differently. And what's, in, what's significant about that is that they believe, firmly believe, all the subjects firmly believe that their later recollection is more accurate than the one that they had right at the time. 
because it's drawing on a different reference database of experiences. The memories have been recontextualized. So heuristics is the term that he used to describe this. And examples of heuristics, these shortcuts to let the brains make easy decisions, are things like common sense. Common sense is a heuristic. Rules of thumb is a heuristic. Intuition, when you make an intuitive decision about something, that's a heuristic. Let's give an example of that right now. After 9-11, the airlines almost all went out of business. We all remember that. A lot of people were afraid of flying, perceiving that flying was more dangerous. So perfectly honestly, show of applause if you felt in any way that flying was more dangerous after 9-11. There's, there's a, a smattering of applause and a lot more people who aren't too embarrassed that they thought the same thing because we're at a skeptics conference. <laughs> in fact, in the six months following 9-11, about 1,600 people died in road accidents who would not otherwise have died because of the increased traffic. Flight travel didn't get more dangerous. Road travel did. That was an example of a heuristic, the obvious intuitive guess that air travel seems more dangerous now, being wrong. So let's have three people come up who did not go to their 20 year high school reunion because you didn't like the people there. <laughs> I'm sure there is someone else in this room. No, no turning around going back to your seat. We're gonna use you too. Okay, we've got these three people now. I want you to each give me simply three adjectives that describe the people you didn't want to see. Stuck up. Two. Uh, didn't like uh, nerdly types, although it's not one word. <laughs> who, who, what nerdly type who, who, who you're talking about? Oh, yourself, got it. All right, <laughs> you've had more than three. Uh, malicious, self-centered, bullying. Boring. I can't think of <laughs> That's enough right there. Okay, thank you very much. You're dismissed. Now, obviously, all the people at your 20 year high school reunions were not all of those things. You had a preconceived notion, and it colored your perception of what your experience was going to be going to that. These are all very common things. People who you have not seen in 20 years, you really don't know anything about them. And they're probably very different people than they were in high school. So we do have preconceived notions, prejudices, things like that. I certainly do. It, it colors what I do on my podcast. They're very real and they do affect us. They're, and they come, again, from our experiential database. It's not a brain fail so much. It's your brain working properly, interpreting its experiential database. So, by a show of applause again, how many people have taken vitamin C for a cold? How many of you have over-the-counter cough syrup at home? How many of you expect to get better when you take them? Okay. These are preconceived notions. You've heard that they work based on your experiential database. The data shows that none of those do anything whatsoever for you. But we perceive that they work because that's how we interpret our experiential database. So for all of you who think you're too smart and too skeptical to fall for any of this, if you've got a pen and paper, perfect. If you don't, draw with your finger or something. I want you to draw two circles, basically the wheels of a bicycle. You're all so great at perceiving your experiences. Now draw four or five lines representing the frame of that bicycle. And what you're all going to find out very quickly, all except a very few of you, is that you have no idea what those four or five lines of a bicycle frame look like. Almost nobody can draw one. Anyone having luck? Anyone experiencing that right now? Anyone too embarrassed to raise their hand or clap? Come on. I see some hands going up. It is very hard to do. Um, you've seen bicycles 
10,000 times at least. You just, you just didn't study them very well. It's like when I made fun of Spoonie up here for, her, for not being able to count the number of people standing against the wall. Our brains just get the, the idea of a bicycle. It's not the digital photograph of a bicycle. Here's something else that we've all seen 10,000 times, and a lot of us are going to get this wrong too. What object, when held out at arm's length, is about the same size as a full moon? I'm going to give you a list of objects starting from way too small, going to way too big, and somewhere in there is the correct answer. Here's the list of objects. A BB, a P, a dime, a nickel, a quarter, a golf ball, a baseball, a softball, a frisbee, a basketball, and a beach ball. Now let's go through that list again with a show of applause for each one. A BB. A P. A dime. A nickel. A quarter. A golf ball. It's funny, I always see all these people out here doing this. <laughs> Baseball. Softball. We still got some votes coming in. Frisbee. <laughs> I think we'll cut it off there. Almost all of you voted dime. That was by far the most popular answer, what I was hearing up here. And I'm not sure how many of you said that because you heard Phil Plate talking about that. He was actually asking a different question. How far away from you would a dime have to be to, look at the si to appear to be the size of the full moon? And it was a lot longer than arm's length. The correct answer is actually a P. Now, you've all seen the full moon so many times. And a lot of you grossly misestimated its size. Next time you're outside and you see the full moon, reach your fingers up there about as far apart, and you'll see it's a good-sized pea, but it's clearly smaller than a dime. You've all just made perceptual errors. The brain is terrible at collecting data, and it's wonderful at collecting ideas. Okay, I'd like to have one person come up here who thinks that they, their brain is very good at collecting data. One person who doesn't mind being terribly embarrassed. <laughs> okay. Now watch this. I'm going to read a string of numbers and have you repeat them back to me. Do you want to just run away now? Three, six, four, five, two, one, seven, seven, zero. Oh, Nine, four, eight, zero. Oh. And what's the expiration date on that? <laughs> okay. uh, I killed myself in my own joke. That's terrible. <laughs> Give up. Uh, those were one in there. Uh, <laughs> let's see. One, two, four, three. Oh. Wow. You're done. Thank you very much. Think what a better job almost anything could have done than a human brain. A pen and paper would have worked, would have kicked that little job's ass. Uh, you could have carved it on the side of a cave and gotten a better answer. Obviously, any kind of a recording device would have done a far, far better job than a brain at something as simple as that. So while we're on the subject of perceptual errors, um, this is kind of the meat of the show right here. We need to have five volunteers who are good at perceiving things. If you believe you're pretty good at perceiving, and we're, we're, this is no trick questions, how many people are in the room, if you think you have a good general ability to perceive the world around you, five of you step on up. <laughs> one, one at a time here. Next. Next. Next.
Next. Obviously the one who's most confident in his abilities. Okay. These are questions about how you perceive the world. Now these are not exactly right and wrong questions. Here is an example. If I ask you which is bigger, a house or a flagpole, which is taller, a house or a flagpole? Obviously some flagpoles are shorter than houses, obviously some houses are taller than flagpoles, but generally a flagpole is taller than a house. So if I were to ask that question, which is taller, a house or a flagpole, say flagpole. I want no help from the audience, no reactions, no twittering. <laughs> okay, here we go. Which is heavier, a school bus or a locomotive? I think a school bus. Oh, school bus. School bus. A locomotive. A school bus. Okay. Which is physically larger, a novel or a dictionary? I've seen a lot of big novels. I'm going to go with that. Yeah, it depends on the language of the dictionary, but I'll, no, I'll go with novel. I'm going to go with an unabridged dictionary. I'll also go with the dictionary. Uh, with the novels I read, <laughs> I can pretend to be smart or dumb here, but I, I think novel. Okay. Which is louder, a gunshot or a basketball bounce? Well, uh, depends on proximity, but I'm going to say basketball bounce. Oh, that would really depend on the gun, right? Uh, In general. Basketball? <laughs> basketball. Gunshot? Basketball. Which has more parts, a Lego set or a Rubik's Cube? Rubik's Cube. Lego set, Rubik's Cube. Well, there's that Death Star with 5,000 pieces, so I'm gonna go with Lego set. <laughs> Rubik's Cube. Which has more spots? Two, two dice or a book written in Braille? Which has more spots? More dots, spots, whatever you call them. Two dice or a page of a book written in Braille? Dice. Yep, dice. Dice. Braille. Dice. <laughs> Which goes higher, a balloon or a rocket? A oh, balloon. Balloons, clearly. Balloon. 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 Which holds more water, a bucket or a wheelbarrow? Bucket. Mm. Yeah, bucket. 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 Which is longer, the Golden Gate Bridge or a football field? Football field. Yep, football field. Football field. Football field. Which is faster, a race car or a satellite? Satellite. Oh, race car. Race car. Satellite. Race car. Three more. Which lasts longer? A parade or a work day? <laughs> well, there's a Puerto Rican day parade. Uh, parade. Mm. I say work. Parade. Parade? The parade. Okay, which looks brighter in the sky, Venus or the full moon? Venus. Yeah, Venus. Venus. 
Or moon. Venus. And finally, which is smaller, a coin or an aspirin? A coin. Um, aspirin? Which is smaller, a coin or an aspirin? Aspirin. Coin. Okay, thank you all very much. You can all take your seats. Now we see that one of our fine volunteers did not take his seat. You may have noticed that I whispered something. In fact, I certainly hope you did, because that would be a perceptual error if you missed it. I whispered something to each person, and he's here because I whispered something different to them. I told him to stay behind. I told all of them to always give me the wrong answer. At what point did you figure that out? I was very confused. I was like, what? Did I? You gave some answers that you believed to be wrong because other people were giving them, didn't you? Maybe. Okay, thanks. You can go for real now. Steve mentioned this brief, or excuse me, Bruce Hood mentioned this briefly. This is called the Ash Conformity Effect. Conforming to our peers and wanting to say what other people expect us to say and having the experience that we ex think, believe that we're expected to have is the Ash Conformity Effect. And it's another major driver of fallacious perception, why people's personal experiences are wrong to them. They genuinely want to be conforming. Maybe not consciously, but it's, it, it, at a subconscious level, we all want to have the experience that we're expected to have. Okay, here is one more way that our brain can fool us. Show me a sign of applause if you think that emergency room visits are more common during a full moon. How about applause if more babies are born at hospitals during a full moon? Someone's been listening to Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. More police calls, more, more police calls for violent crime during a full moon. Okay, now most other audiences who don't listen to Skeptic's Guide Universe, they applaud wildly for all three of those, and a lot of you applauded for some of them. The fact is, of course, the data shows clearly that none of these are true. However, the people who work in the hospitals, the police departments, the emergency personnel, many of them firmly believe that these are true, even though their daily personal experience shows them that it doesn't happen, they are misperceiving it. What do we call this? Confirmation bias. This is something that colors, it's one of these things that colors our perception, colors the way we retrieve information from our experiential database. It's one of the better known and, and still one of the most common brain fails. So I'm just one... I'm, <laughs> I didn't bring my tin foil. I'm going to leave you with just one little, one little story that I think is a great example of this, a great example for all of us to try to follow. Um, many of you may have read Robert Heinlein's novel, A Stranger in a Strange Land. And in this story, there were characters called fair witnesses. These were people whose whole job was to simply observe, and they were very trained in, a, in the powers of observation, powers of perception, and their statements were legal testimony in court. It was accepted as fact. And at one point in the book, one of them asks one of these fair witnesses, what color is that house up on the hill? And she says, it's blue on this side. <laughs> How many of us would have made an assumption about that that's not necessarily true? Thank you very much. My name is Brian Dunning. This talk is Your Brain Sucks. And I give it wherever anyone buys me a plane ticket to go. Thank you very much. Brian Dunning. Brian Dunning.